it all down. I'm count zero. Now, this week I'm going to skew a bit from my usual book and game alternating review schedule to review one of the books that's on my to-review to list and one related to a video game I reviewed recently, specifically The Bourne Conspiracy. This week I'm taking a look at The Bourne Identity by Robert Ludlum. This is an older edition of the book that I'm showing off. A more recent edition of the book will likely have a cover related to the film starring Matt Damon. Now I'm not going to go in depth into the suspense thriller genre here, as this is a genre that's basically clear to most audiences um, in terms of what it is. Whereas other genres that I've discussed has been a more has been more obscure, or the boundaries can really be more clouded. Particularly the fantasy genre, where a lot of people are of the mind that fantasy is fantasy is fantasy, without the differentiations that different genres have. I'm also not going to go too much in depth into the premise of this. As most of you are familiar with this from the book, at least the beginning of this. A man is fished out of the water in the Mediterranean Sea, he has amnesia, and a bank account number in his leg. On microfilm, instead of, instead of the little LED gadget version that's in the film. Then that account is, that, that device, or microfilm, has an account number tied to a bank in Zurich. After the horrific injuries the man um, has suffered have recovered, he goes to Zurich to recover his identity and discover he's a trained killer and that people want to kill him. You've seen the film, that bit you know. But those are the point where the film and the book version differ, and the reason for the change between the two versions is the antagonists, in part. In the film, Bourne is hunted by the organization that created him, Treadstone. In the book, on the other hand, he is hunted by the villain he was sent out to kill, a real-world figure named Carlos the Jackal. The Jackal was born Iliot Ramirez Sanchez, and was, for a time, one of the most notorious terrorists in the world. He is, for the, basically, the 70s and 80s, all the way up to the very early 90s, what, well, Osama bin Laden was until his death. Well, from 9-11 to his death, anyway. Carlos was trained at a, really trained at a Soviet facility, but basically flunked out, and ended up being bound, uh, joining a Palestinian ter liberation terrorist group, getting kicked out of that, then basically going, well, screw you guys, I'll start my own terrorist organization with blackjack and strippers. And that's what he did. Okay, maybe without the blackjack and strippers, but anyway. Um, so... The real Carlos is basically, he's a terrorist. He was he ran his own organization. He did do help out other groups, but he was his own thing. He, he, was, he was a terrorist, an actual terrorist terrorist. He blew up stuff, people performed assassinations for political and ideological goals. On the other hand, Carlos in the book is very different. Carlos in the book is, well... An assassin. He is a hired paid assassin. If you want someone dead, typically you being someone working for a terrorist organization or something else, if you want someone dead, you pay Carlos enough money and he will do it for you. And no one's stopped him because nobody knows what he looks like and he has a massive, massive conspiracy behind him. Enough with that he can have someone killed, as far as someone who could possibly identify him or is investigating him. He can have them killed in Canada, even though he is in France. Or he can have a building in New York massacred while he is in France or other, where, other places in Europe, Zurich. Is this unrealistic? Oh, absolutely this is unrealistic. This is also a Robert Ludlum novel. This happens in all of his books. Robert Ludlum's bread and butter is the conspiracy thriller. It's an individual or pair of people basically facing off against a massive monolithic conspiracy that can destroy them theoretically at their whim, but they stay one step ahead and possibly even manage to unravel the conspiracy or at least set it back by the book's conclusion. This is what he does. This is what every Robert Ludlum story has in some ways its driving force. So, 
it's kind of to be expected that Carl Ellis would have such a massive organization here. This leads to the difference in Bourne's mission. In the film, Bourne is basically an assassin. Treadstone points him at a target, Bourne kills it. In the book, on the other hand, his objective is much more complicated. His job is to kill Carlos the Jackal, and to do this, he has to basically pose as being a better assassin than Carlos. And he does this by stealing Carlos' thunder, by taking credit for his hits, by being seen in the place where these hits occur before and after the hits occur, forwarding it through of his, hit, his hits, and then going and doing some other ones for basically for hire, but with the approval of the U.S. government. And the idea is Carlos will be upset and infuriated by his, for the credit being taken, by the thunder being stolen from him, and thus will stick his head out and Bourne can cut it off. And that's kind of iffy in terms of how it works. If any of you remember around 9-11, after the attacks occurred, every terrorist organization under the sun took credit for September 11. I mean, it is the biggest terrorist attack in American soil ever. It Before then, the only thing that could have equaled it was the attacks against the Edward R. Murrow, I think it was the Edward R. Murrow, but the uh, federal building in Oklahoma City. Everyone took credit for 9-11 attacks, until finally intelligence services determined that, in fact, no, the real killer, the real masterminds of this attack, was Al-Qaeda. Such a thing would also be the case for, well, Carlos' assassinations in the real world, or real world. People would be, in short, taking credit for every single hit Carlos ever did. Every hit that Carlos ever did. And so, ultimately, the real professionals, the people who could afford Carlos' services, could find him and get in touch with him, would be also in the position to investigate these hits and determine who really did it. They would have intelligence services of their own, that would hire him to do untouchable work. They would be in the terrorist circles where they would be able to hear from other people, oh yes, we, hi we hired Carlos for this hit. And they would know that they had the, would have the resources to do this, and that sort of thing. Carlos, if he was a real person, and in the real world, would not have survived long by sticking his neck out and getting upset every time somebody took credit for one of his operations. Our next major difference is related to Bourne's love interest, Marie. In the film, she's kind of generic French-ish in her nationality, and she's trying to emigrate to the United States. She's something of a drifter. In the book, on the other hand, this is very, very different. For starters, she's Canadian. Second, Bourne meets her on, in Zurich when she's there on business for an economics conference because she is a professor of economics. And, and a very, very intelligent woman at that. And even works for the Canadian government, giving her some government ties, which Bourne uses in the book. And when it comes to her taking Bourne to Paris, it is not because he waved a giant wad of francs in her face. No, no, not in the slightest. He took her at gunpoint. In fact, there's a long sequence with him holding her hostage and him taking her from place to place in Zurich as he desperately tries to recover some portions of his identity after the attempted assassination on him, and this then very nearly ends badly for her, where uh, Carlos' men capture both of them, almost kill both of them, and she is nearly raped by one of Carlos' men. And if you've seen the film, you know, no rape sequences here, at all, ever, in the film. So, totally dramatic shift. Marie is no isn't the passive kind of rolling along with it character she is in the book, 
with other she's in the film. And Marie is, in fact, much more involved in Bourne's search for his identity, not just in terms of being his grounding figure, who stays with him for the entire thing and keeps him anchored to reality. But also Marie provides useful insight in terms of how the economics, how the finances for an organization like Carlos's would have to work. And she uses her government ties, come in a couple times. And her, they even end up exposing, through her government ties, a degree of Carlos's reach and setting that up for the audience as well. There is some kind of awkward undertones to that rape scene in Zurich, though. Because the Marie Bourne romance doesn't show up at all, doesn't start at all, until Bourne saves her from the rapist. I don't know precisely what to say about as far as what to describe this, but it feels kind of squicky when your main female character falls in love with your main male lead because the male lead saved her from rape and immediately, almost immediately she's head over heels for him. That just puts a bad taste in my mouth. Not to mention she already has a boyfriend, I actually believe husband, before, the rape, before she comes to Zurich and... It's not like she suddenly falls for her born after her husband's death or her or born as her rebound guy or anything like that. No, it's it's just Oh, you saved me from rape, I must be madly in love with you now. And the undertones and overtones and other connotations of that are Ugh. Now we gotta talk some more about some of the other problems with this book as well. Ludlum Strength is a good job of writing captivating conspiracy thrillers with interesting characters and a conspiracy which, while not totally realistic, can be described as something different. There is, I mean, you, it's not just the monolithic corporate conspiracy, there are the elements of that. It's not definitely not the ethnic conspiracy. It's not the Protocols of the Elders of Zion kind of level bullcrap. But it is interesting. It, they tend to be okay. They have their problems, but they're alright. However, this book went into a tonal problem where he did do Ludlum's usual conspiracy. Because they made Carlos an assassin. Oddly enough, the real world Carlos would fit perfectly for the labyrinthine conspiracy that backs his organization. You see, Carlos in the book just wants to be an assassin. He has no goal to rule the world. He has no goal to manipulate international politics. He has no goal to, oh, for example, let's say, oh, I don't know, hold the world for ransom by threatening to set off volcanoes or that sort of thing and take over the world that way. No, no. He's a quite happy with what he does. He does his job well. He, it seems like, enjoys his job. He treats his employees fairly, unless they really mess up. And he he's a good boss for an evil mastermind assassin. But he, but it's just, it, his organization doesn't fit his goal. Additionally, there's one other matter that kind of bugs me. In the book, Bourne's organization that's backing him, Treadstone, is wiped out by a couple of Carlos's men. Bourne basically is framed for this. Carlos's operatives were actually more infiltra have infiltrated the CIA and other parts of the Treadstone organization have learned of it, and that's how they brought it down. But, well, Bourne gets framed anyway. And the weird part of this is, well... There is plenty of evidence to the contrary. The last surviving member of Treadstone's top staff, Alex Conklin, is mentioned in dialogue that he is aware of the presence of Marie in Paris, and Bourne's very close ties to Marie, and that wherever she is, so is he in terms of city. He never strays too far from her, ever. Ever! So... Consequently, Bourne's operation, Bourne's presence in New York 
doesn't mesh with his previous actions with Marie. We basically lose a dialogue that goes something like this. Goddamn Bourne! He's killed our entire operation. He's killed all our top operatives. All of our top brands except for a few of us. It, it must be Bourne. He's the only one who could have done this. Now, he's never got ever, ever got too far from the Marie girl. Where we find Marie, we'll find Bourne. And Mar Marie would never even leave a country without her. Is Marie still in France? Yes, sir. Marie is still in France. Has never, ever left the country since she arrived there earlier earlier in the month. Good. Send the hit squads. Send them now. That's literally basically how the dialogue scene goes. And Alex Conklin does not leave this straight and narrow path of Bourne must have done it for the entire appearance of the book. He only leaves it when he gets a direct order from a superior. Bourne explains it to him his amnesia and everything. He refuses to believe. Marie explains it to him. He refuses to, or through, tries to explain it to him through an agency operative. He refuses to believe. A mental health professional explains it to him. He refuses to believe. When you're not listening to a doctor about his speciality, who a doctor tells you, no, it's not that he's snapped and gone rogue. It's that, in short, you treated them like garbage. Uh, the, sorry, he went through absolute mental heck, or even actually full on mental hell, by being shot repeatedly, including a head wound, and getting dumped into the Mediterranean in a bad part time of year to be dumped in the Mediterranean. And spent a prolonged period of time there that can cause problems with his head due to his mental stress when they say that to you and you don't listen you look like a total douche canoe not to mention to do to really persist in this you have to be willfully ignorant or holding the idiot ball and frankly I don't cut either of those any options any slack. If you're holding the idiot ball, then the writer is engaging in bad writing by making a character dumb just for the sake of conflict or to have somebody explain something to the audience when this character should not be that dumb. If the character is being willfully ignorant, then the character is not acting in an endearing fashion and I don't care about this character because he's being willfully ignorant. So, Conklin and his actions and his attempt to hunt down Bourne actually end up hurting the book. I found that once Conklin and the Treadstone Hunt started up, I found myself liking those sections less and they re reduced my enjoyment of the book as opposed to the sections of the Bourne, Carlos, not quite cat and mouse game, but much more game of figurative, figurative chess between the two of them. Actually, I almost compare it more to the game Fox and Geese, if you're familiar with it. If not, do a Wikipedia search. I'll put a link to the Wikipedia page in the show notes. So, the verdict. When it comes to the conspiracy thriller genre, the book is much better. The game of chess between the two men on the streets of Paris and Zurich is incredibly captivating and much deeper than the more basic game of cat and mouse we see in the film. In the book, Bourne and Carlos are at each other's throats. They're at loggerheads. They want to destroy each other. They need to destroy each other. Neither one will be safe until the other is defeated. It's spelled out pretty clearly. On the other hand, in the film, Bourne simply wants to escape. He wants to slip the trap, he wants to evade his pursuers, and he wants to be left alone. Ultimately, when Bourne does confront Treadstone at the end of the Bourne identity, his objective is simply to be left alone. That's all he wants. Get Treadstone out of his hair. He succeeds, but it's a simpler story in that regard. One which fits in better with the concepts of 
the film or the structure of the film rather than the book where you get more runtime, you have more time to explore this conspiracy. This isn't to say the film is bad. Not at all. The film is very good. The film is very, very good. The film does a really good job of setting up uh, well, car chases, including some of the best car chases in all of film history. I would compare it and put it at the same level as the car chases in John Frankenheimer's Ronin, and even, I would say, above the car chase in The French Connection. Also, I would say that the fight scenes in the film are pretty well done. We don't get the same degree of shaky cam we get in later books in the series. And, well, I would say that these both succeed. They're both good. You can't go wrong with either one. With that said, the books and the films are going to go in radically different directions from here on out. Bourne's origin story is the same. Batman is Batman is Batman, in a sense. And so we have the common threads here between the two. But from henceforth, it's sort of like with the Bond novels, almost, where at a point, the only thing the Bond novels have in common with their films is the title. And the same case is here. Bourne's next novel, The Bourne Supremacy, takes him to, Sa to Hong Kong and other areas of Southeast Asia, Asia and China for his next mission. Or rather, his next search for identity and for proof of innocence. The Bourne Supremacy film, on the other hand, takes Bourne to Russia and throughout Eastern Europe. The Bourne Ultimatum, on the other hand, puts Bourne in the novel, puts Bourne back in touch with Carlos, back in conflict with Carlos one final time to basically settle it out between the two of them. The Bourne Supremacy no uh, film, on the other hand, puts Bourne back in conflict with the newly revived form of Treadstone. And actually, the films always keep this common thread of Treadstone and later its successor in Blackbriar. So, that pretty much covers that in terms of the films. They're both good and, I mean, there is no doubt that these both succeed in different respects, but they are both su both succeed at what they set out to do. So, that pretty much wraps up that, except for one thing. And this is for another future review. Aside from the film with Matt Damon, there is one other film adaptation of the Born Identity, and one which I have not seen, and I hope to review at some point in the future. This version stars Richard Chamberlain, and was made for television in 1988. And it was available for Netflix, so I was able to get a hold of it. And so I'll be reviewing that in a future episode. But until next time, I'm Count Zero. Thanks for watching. Mm -hmm.